San Antonio. Revival for Christ, both in America and in the Philippines. rejoice and be glad in it. How many of you love the Lord tonight? Oh, I can't hear you, church. Do you love Jesus? We love you tonight. Welcome on this beautiful Word Wednesday. We've got a great service in store for you tonight. I know the Lord is here to meet your need, to touch and bless you. How many of you came with something ready for God to touch you tonight? Amen? He's going to be there for you. What about you, honey? You ready for service? Well, I have missed you guys. So it's good to be in the house of the Lord tonight. Praise the Lord. We just got back from Mexico just the other day. Our son got married in Mexico, Cancun, our youngest son. And uh, he married the lovely Angela. So now we have an Angela Vanover. So that's a good thing. I'll tell you what. Let's go before the Lord in a word of prayer. Get this service started the right way. And that is in the presence of the Lord. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, God, as we come before you, God, we come not with our own ability nor by our own power, but God, we come by your spirit and by your anointing. God, I pray, Father, right now that you will loose a dynamic and anointed anointing in this place tonight. 
Lord, everyone watching us, everyone with us, God, touch them right where they are, even in their homes. Those right now, God, that are battling a sickness in their body, I take authority over it right now. You said by your stripes, we are healed. Devil, you are a liar and a father. I command you in the name of Jesus to take your hands off God's people. God, bring healing, bring restoration, exalt and lift up. Lord, we have some friends in the ministry who have been battling and fighting. And God, we pray healing and restoration for them, God. Lord, let this service be dedicated to thy glory and to thy honor. Give us ears to hear and eyes to see. In Jesus' mighty and powerful name we pray. And the church said, amen. Praise the Lord. Are you ready to praise the Lord tonight? I can't hear you, Revival for Christ. Are you ready? <laughs> All right, praise the Lord. Our, as many of you already know, our main praise leader, Sister Tasha, had a procedure not long ago, and so she's out tonight. Praise the Lord. Our son just got married, so he's not here tonight. However, we are blessed with the San Antonio slash Monroe slash Seattle, Washington connection. Praise the Lord. So let's get ready to praise the Lord. Who's ready? All right, let's do it. San Antonio, Monroe, and Seattle, Washington. Let's praise the Lord.
God, Lord, to come and to worship you and to open up our heart, God, that we might receive your divine word, Lord. Father, break every chain, God, that holds us back from receiving your precious word. Break every chain. Oh, break every chain. Break every chain.
Praise the Lord. Nothing but the blood. Amen. I love that blood. Don't you love that blood of Jesus? Don't you love that every chain can be broken by the anointing and the power of the Lord? Amen. Right now, we just before we change the order of service, get into the word tonight, we have something very special for you. Brother Andrew's going to sing special for you tonight. Give Drew the hand. He's going to sing something special for you. Fresh, fresh fire, give me a fresh, fresh fire, give me a fresh, fresh fire, I'm gonna burn for you, give me a fresh, fresh fire, give me a fresh, fresh fire, give me a fresh, fresh fire, I'm gonna burn for you. breath I'm breathing in each moment I'm giving God if I live I live for you and I love your presence see all my obsession God if I live I live for you yeah give me your fresh fresh fire Control, I want that fire. 
fresh, fresh fire. Give me a fresh, fresh fire. How will you desire? I'm gonna burn for you. Give me a fresh, fresh fire. Give me a fresh, fresh fire. How will you desire? I'm gonna burn for you. I'm gonna burn for you. Yeah, yeah I'm gonna burn for you. And nothing else. And yeah, I'm gonna burn for you. Oh, thank you, Jesus. I'm gonna burn for you. Amen. Praise the Lord. Brother Andrew, I want a fresh, fresh fire. Amen. How many of you want that fresh fire in your spirit today? Amen. Praise the Lord. Put your hands together for our praise and worship team under the direction of our own prophetess, Sandra Cardenas. Amen. Praise God. They did a great job tonight. All right. Let's everybody stand to our feet. We're going to change the order of the service. Get right into the word this morning or this evening. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, God, as we come before you, we come not in our own ability, but Lord, we come by your anointing. Father, we ask you, God, right now, Lord, to speak to your people tonight. Let the words that be preached here not be our words, not be our knowledge, not be our understanding, but God, let it be performed by the anointing. Let it be performed by the Spirit and the power of a living God. Father, I turn the service over to you completely. In Jesus' mighty and powerful name we pray. And the church said, amen. Praise the Lord. You can be seated if you want to. Praise the Lord. Now, just before I get ready to start preaching, you know, we are now in December. We're just a week away from Christmas. So I want to share with you a little bit about the birth of Christ tonight. And we'll get into that in a minute. But before we do, I want to talk about uh, what we do here at Revival for Christ. One of the projects that we have going is the Sharon L. Vanover Memorial Dinner and Christmas event. We work with public schools here in the area to identify at-risk uh, children and families that probably won't have any Christmas. We bring them in and we bring Christmas to them. Now, every year we've done it every Tuesday and on the Saturday of December. We've been doing this now about 16 years. And right now, as it stands, we've reached over 23,000 families. And come on, somebody give the Lord a prayer and help them have Christmas. Amen. 23,000 families have we helped in that amount of time. This year, we're probably looking right at 1,000 to 1,100 families that we're able to help. It's been cut down quite a bit because of the pandemic. But anyway, let's give the Lord the praise. I mean, I still want to give God praise that we're able to bring Christmas into the hearts of so many people. All right, now, like I said before, I want to talk to you a little bit about the birth of Christ. I know everybody thinks they understand the birth. Everybody under thinks they understand his death. However, I want to get into some sides of the birth that maybe you just, maybe you do know. Maybe, maybe you totally got it all understood. But maybe there's something here that if we dig together, we can pull a little revelation, a little understanding out, and begin to glean some knowledge that will anoint us and move us forward in the purpose and the plan that God has determined for us to have. Amen? So go with me in your Bibles, if you would, please, to St. Luke. Going to go to Luke. Now, like I said, uh, we are now quickly approaching... Now, and I realize this, you know, everybody wants to argue about this and bring this up. You know, well, you know, Jesus wasn't really born 
on December 25th. I know that is the argument. I know that uh, a lot of uh, people understand that actually uh, Christmas was originally a pagan holiday, that uh, uh, some of the churches changed it to kind of put a Christ Christian spin on it. But here's what I want you to know about Christmas. The point is this. Was Jesus born on this earth 2,000 years ago? Yes, he was. Was he born winter, spring, or summer? I don't know and I don't care because it didn't change the fact he was born on this time. Now, the reason why this day, I don't care about what the past of it was. I'm interested in the future of it. I'm interested of the present of it. Let me tell you something, church. One thing about it is, whether you like it or not, for one moment around this world, people got to stop and think, Jesus Christ was born on this day. Oh, I know they attach all the other things to it. But at the end of the day, it's about the birth of Jesus Christ, the Savior of the whole world. Everything associated with Christmas is peace, love, hope. And that's all you'd ever get from Jesus. It's peace, love, hope, equality, passion, forgiveness, salvation. Amen? Like to go with me in your Bibles, please, if you would. And we're going to start reading in St. Luke chapter 2. St. Luke chapter 2 is where we're going to start reading. And I'll read this out of King James. <clears throat> Thank you, Jesus. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar of Augustus that the whole world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Quirius was governor of Syria. And they went and be taxed everyone to his own city. And Joseph also uh, went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth under Judea and unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem. Because he was of the house and of the lineage of David. To be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, her days should be accomplished and she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger. Because there was no room for them at the end. Now, we've heard this story a million times. We've seen this story. Charlie Brown uh, has this story. You know, everybody has done this story about when they went and there was a tax season going on and he went with his espoused wife and while they were there, she delivered and she had a child. Now, we all know that story, but we're not looking for the spiritual significances that exist in that story. Spiritual connections which connect us to a spiritual truth or a spiritual understanding which will solidify and validate and establish our relationship with him even greater than it was when we stepped in. Amen. Now, here's the thing. Jesus knew from the day he was born what he was facing. Y'all aren't listening to me. From the day he was born, he knew what he was facing. Look what it said. Where was Jesus born? Jesus wasn't born in a mansion. Jesus wasn't born in a castle. Jesus wasn't born in uh, some fancy place. He was born in a stable. He was born where the animals are housed. He was born in the most simple, most honest place you could possibly be born. Why? Because God said, my son is not coming in with the tapestries of this world. My son is not coming in with the distractions of this world. My son is not here to impress this world. My son is here to change the world and to bring my people back into relationship with me. Now, when Jesus came, what did the Bible say? Let's look what it says. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no what? I'm sorry, there was no what? I'm sorry, there was no what? There was no room at the end for Jesus. There was no room at the end for his mother. There was no room at the end for his father. Here is a, here is a woman pregnant about to give birth and nobody has the compassion no one has the understanding to give up a space so she can have her baby born in a proper place. But see, that's the thing you need to understand. Jesus knew when he was coming into this world that nobody really wanted him to be here, that nobody was really wanting what he had to offer. But he also knew that when they begin to understand it, when they begin to comprehend it, when they begin to embrace it, when they begin to allow it to deliver their soul and establish their faith, they'd want more. 
They didn't want all that and much more. See, Jesus came into this world with no room at the end. He also knows that for a lot of people, there's no room for him in your heart. You have absolutely no room for him. And what rooms you do have for him? You have a room in the basement. You have a closet in the back of the house. You have a shed out front. But you're not letting him fully in the house. Can you say amen? Come on, hear me now. You got to start making room for Jesus in your house. You've got to start stepping back and saying, wait a minute. I want to remove every distraction. I want to remove every element of my flesh that keeps me from spiritual perfection with Jesus Christ. I do not want to reject his image because I've made no room in my life. Can I tell you what I'm talking about? Some of you, I'll do this for God if I get time. If it works into my schedule, I'll do it. You know, we would come to the church event, but we got family coming. We got other folks, and we got we to gotta take time to be family. Why don't you bring family to the church event? Oh, we don't want family to get embarrassed by the church folk. We got to have family where they're at. We don't want the church folks to embarrass them. We don't want them to embarrass the church folks. We we'll just keep them at home. See, the problem is you're still not leaving any room for Christ. See, Christ has no room in your life. He has no room in your heart. The very little amount of room you've given him, he can barely move around. But I'm here to tell you, church, that it's time to allow the word, the spirit, the power, the authority and anointing of God to begin to break down the hindrances, to begin to break down the divisions, to begin to break down those elements which have kept us from spiritual perfection, those elements which have kept us from excellence in Christ Jesus. You say, I have room in my heart. For Jesus, do you? Do you? When he tells you to do something you don't want to do, you don't want to. When he tells you to give up something you don't want to give up, is there room? Come on, you ain't hear me, church. I said when he comes to you tell and tells you you got to give up that thing you love, when he comes to you and tells you you got to surrender that thing that you justify, that thing you've held on to, will there be room for Jesus. Will you receive? Will you receive? Will you get a revelation of overcoming obedient manifestation in your life? Or is there no room for Christ in your life? Has he no place to lay his head? Has he no place that he can come and fellowship and sup with you? What is there? The Bible tells us there was no room. No one showed mercy. No one showed understanding. Jesus came in under some of the most difficult conditions that a person could come into. He had no place to be born. Had no place to lay his head. But this was not something God was surprised by. Man had never made room for Jesus. Man had never made room for God. God was always second. God's plans were always second. God's purpose was always second. But I got news for you. When Jesus came on the scene, Jesus said there's going to be a change. Jesus said there's going to be a reformation. There's going to be an anointing. There's going to be a restoration. There will be a change, and there will be room for Christ in your house. Not just room, the chiefest of seats. Can you say amen? When you get you off the throne of your heart, then there will be room for Jesus to sit on the throne of your heart. Problem is, as long as you're there, he's still in the basement. So you've got to make a decision. I want to ask you a question. Stop for just a minute and think about this. Are there places in your life that you need to make room for God? Are there things in your life where you've not made any room for Jesus? Are there things in your life that you've justified and you've created and you've made so long, you've justified them that you can't push them out of your life? Now let me tell you something. You've got to come to the place that when God says something, you will do it. You won't argue about it. 
when God tries to get you to clean up your house, when God tries to get you to throw the garbage in the trash out, you won't sit there and argue with him and justify with him why you need to keep it in there. See, I love you, baby, but there's a lot of you tonight. You're a bunch of hoarders. All you do is hoard up stuff. All you do is hoard up ideas, hoard up dreams, hoard up things you think are important. All you do is hoard up a bunch of ideas that God never gave you anyway. It's something that came from the manifestation of your flesh. It's something that came from the lust of your flesh. Come on now. And it don't matter how much money you got. It don't matter how much you got or no got. Everybody has got too much going on to make room for Jesus. <clears throat> Jesus, I'll come see you at Christmas. Jesus, I'll come to church at Easter and Christmas. Rest time, God, I'm just too busy. I got family. I got things I need to do. I got things I want to do. I don't know what to do. Wonder what's going to be like when you stand before him someday. And he looks at you and says, Son, is this my new man? What else new in here? You never made room for me. All you made room for your video games. You made room for your television. You made room for laying around on your backside again. You made time to go out and party with your friends. You made room for everybody, but you didn't make no room for me. You didn't make no room for me. And let me tell you something, church. We need to do more than make room. Oh, y'all ain't listening to me. We have. We should have made room 2,000 years ago. But now we got to stop making room. We got to build a house. We got to make a new house. We got to stick out all the hoarding. We got to get rid of all the sin, all the disobedience, all the justification. And we got to make the house where Jesus got as much room as Jesus wants. Can you say amen? And before he even speaks, before he even says it, we know what God's wanting us to do. We know where God's wanting us to move. We're so in line with him. Our relationship at an intimate level of spiritual understanding, so intense and so great that when Jesus speaks, even before he speaks, his breath, moving the words into motion, calls you to move, calls you to go. That's how much room Jesus is taking up in your life. Amen? <clears throat> so I want to know something tonight. <clears throat> you got any room in your house? You got any room in your house for Jesus? And see, here's the thing. My Bible tells me God is a spirit. They that worship him must worship him in spirit. And in truth. Is that not correct tonight? You must worship him in spirit and in truth. You have to start pushing out the things you hoarded up, the doctrines that are not valid, the teachings that you paid for but really aren't based on scripture or spiritual concept. All the things you filled in this house that was not Jesus. That was not Jesus. It was not Jesus. I don't know if you've ever seen one of those hoarder shows or not. But when they walk into them houses, it's ridiculous. I mean, they got junk and filth and trash everywhere. And they've been collecting it for 50 years. I love you, but some of you look like that to God. Y'all ain't listening to me. Sometimes when Jesus wants to get in there, when he wants to move you, when he wants his anointing and power to operate through you, all he sees is a house full of junk, full of trash. So God says, there's no room for my son in here. We got to get rid of some of this stuff. Some of this stuff's got to go. So what happens? He says, you need to get rid of that. Oh, Lord, I can't get rid of that. Lord, that's valuable to me. 
You don't understand, God. I got to have a little time to do that. I got to have a little time to do this. See, you start justifying all the things that you have hoarded in your house. But, honey, I got news for you. It is time for the church to have a house cleaning. It's time for the church to bring the broom of the Holy Ghost and the Spirit of God into that place and clean your house out. Get your house cleaned out. Get your house cleaned. Stop being a hoarder. Come on. Stop being a hoarder. Start being a boarder. Stop hoarding nonsense and start boarding Jesus. Amen. Start letting Jesus live in your life. Amen. Come on. Say amen. You say, brother, that don't have nothing to do with this. It has everything in the world to do with it. Because Jesus was identifying his purpose right from the day of his birth. His purpose was, there is no place for me in this world. The only place available to me is a stable. The only place available to me is where the animals are kept. And that is the amount of significance and the amount of priority that the world puts on Jesus Christ. And it's what he puts on his churches. Think about it. We just went through a pandemic. Liquor stores open. Marijuana open. Everything open. They're essential. Church is not. Church is no longer essential. No longer essential. How is that? I mean, I get it, man. I mean, you got you people that got to have your stuff, go get your stuff. I get it. But I'll tell you something. You got to have some Jesus, too. You got to get some Christ back in your life. If we're going to have some people that are going to be able to show some love, some compassion, some forgiveness, some equality, they need Jesus in their house. It's time to clean the house, church. I want you to do an evaluation. What is it you've been holding on to? What is it you've been keeping from God? What part of your life is isolated from God so that you may keep it from the light of exposure? Because with the light of exposure comes knowledge. With that knowledge comes the ability, comes a decision to either use the knowledge and eradicate what is causing the problem or allow it to stay. I don't want to do that. See, the point is this. Jesus knew 2,000 years ago there was no place for him. There was only one. There was nobody that really wanted him there. But they didn't matter. He didn't come because they needed him. He didn't come because they made room for him. He came because his father demanded it. He came because God said it's time to go. And Jesus said, yes, Lord. And Jesus did it to obey his father. But when Jesus laid his head in that stable, he knew right now there is no room for me right now. They don't have any room in their heart for me. But the day's coming when I will change them. The day's coming when I'll cover the sin. The day's coming when through salvation and baptism of the Holy Spirit, they'll start making room. They'll start cleaning their houses out. And I'll occupy every room in the house. Can you say praise God? I challenge you, church, this next week, examine your life. Look at your hoarder style and see what you've been hoarding away. Say, God, what part of me have I not exposed to the world? Living in Christ, Holy Trinity. What part of me, God, am I not letting the light shine on? What part of me have I not made room for you? Lord, if there's any area in my heart that I've not made room for you, I pray that you clean out my heart and that, Lord, I will make room for you. Can you say amen? Can you imagine the transformation and the change in your life that would take place if you pushed out all the things that hinder you, if you push all the elements out that distract you, think for just a moment what would happen if you made room. So you wonder why you don't feel God? You wonder why his anointing doesn't move you? You wonder why you walk in there by his praise Lord, but you're standing there like a bump on a log? Very simple. You have a hoarder's house. You can't feel anything. You can't be moved because there is no room in you to move. 
or you are not listening to me. There is no room in you to move. Honey, let me tell you something. It's not the richest man. There's the most anointed man. It's not the man with the most clothes. There's the most anointed man. It's not the one that drives the biggest car. There's the most anointed man. The most, an, the most anointed man is the man that ain't got no trash in his house. Amen? The man that has made room for Jesus. The man that said, yes, Lord, your will, not my will. Amen? All right. So we know that the Bible tells us Jesus had no room at the inn. And we realize some of the spiritual ramifications that that details for us. God was presenting a situation for us. He said, Jesus knows there's no room. It doesn't stop him. He's going to be going in. Whether he's in the room or not, it doesn't matter. But it was a statement of the condition of man. It was a statement of what Jesus was going to have to walk into. He was going to have to walk into a situation where there was no room for him. They didn't want him. They didn't want him. He had to stay. They didn't care what he was bringing to the table. But honey, when they began to hear the words that came out of his mouth, when they begin to hear him speak, and they said he does not speak as one that speaks for himself, but he speaks whatever thus saith the Lord God, I speak unto you. Jesus said, my words are not my words, but whatever my Father says, that's what I'm saying. Amen? The Bible tells us they were astonished. They were amazed that he spoke with authority. He did not speak like the scribes and the Pharisees. He did not speak like the Sanhedrin council. He did not come in and just present a theory or a hypothesis. But when Jesus said it, it happened. When Jesus spoke it, it was true. It was real. And it still is. So Jesus knew the situation he had to face. But I want you to look at what God decided to Go on in St. Luke chapter 2. I'm going to read right in the next verse. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch of their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them. And they were sore afraid. And then the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring unto you good tidings of great joy, which shall be unto all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Now, if the angel was telling you, you're a common man, you're out watching the animals, and a mighty angel appeared and you fell on the ground, you were afraid. And that angel said unto you, Today, John, there is a child born in the city of Oklahoma City, and he's a Savior and Lord of the world. I don't think you'd run out of meat and start looking for a stable. I don't think that's the first option. I think we'd be out looking for the mansion, looking for the castle, looking for the kingdom. Where is this king that's coming? But you see, our king is not one of men's gold, men's stones, and men's ribbons. Our king is a king who wore a crown of thorns so that he could free you from the bondage of your carrying world, so he could free you from the lack of spiritual illumination that comes from the flesh. He wore his crown of thorns. And as the blood ran down from the front of his face, his heart rejoiced because he was obeying his father. He was doing what God said. Now I want you to look. This angel appeared to the shepherd, right? And what did he tell him? Again, something simple. For unto you this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be the sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and laying well in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heaven and hosts praising God. Glory to God in the highest and on earth. Peace and what? Goodwill to men. Amen? Peace and goodwill to men. Now, the angel came. Why did the angel not go to the scribes? Why did the angel not go to the Pharisees? Why did the angel not go to the high priest? Why did the angel not go to the Sanhedrin? He went to shepherds. Simple men.
fighting their sheep, watching over their sheep. Amen? But what they told him, what the angel told him is what brings it into spiritual focus. Now stay with me for just a second. And the Bible tells us in St. John 10 and 14 that he is the good shepherd. He says in John 10 and 11, a good shepherd gives his what? Life for the sheep. Go me to Jeremiah real quick. I want to read to you some of the biblical prophecies concerning Jesus concerning him as the Savior of the world. Go me to Jeremiah 23. Jeremiah 23, and we're going to start reading in the first verse. <clears throat> Woe ye unto you, pastors, that destroy and scatter the sheep of your pastures, saith the Lord. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God of Israel against the pastors that feed my people. You have scattered my flock, and you have driven them away, and have not visited them. Behold, I will visit upon you the evil of your doings, saith the Lord. <clears throat> and I will gather... The remnant of my flock out of all countries that I have driven them, and I will bring them again here into their folds, and they shall be fruitful and increase. And I will set up shepherds over them, which shall feed them, and they shall fear no more, nor be dismayed, neither shall they be lacking with the Lord. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper, and shall execute judgment and justice upon the earth. In his days, Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell in safety. And this is his name, whereby he shall be called the Lord of our righteousness. Therefore, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that they shall no more say, The Lord liveth, uh, which brought up the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. But the Lord liveth, which brought up and led the seed of the house of Israel out of the north country, and from all countries wherewith I have driven them that they should dwell in the land of Egypt. You need to understand something. He gives a warning to pastors here. He says, you pastors that have scattered my sheep, you pastors that have fed my sheep the wrong elements, you pastors that have fed my sheep uh, misconceived ideas and, and philosophies that you created in order to gain personal agenda, in order to accomplish personal gain, he said, I'm done with you. Amen? <clears throat> now, he went to the shepherds in the field, and this is where the spiritual part plays a role. He goes to the shepherds in the field, didn't go to the Sanhedrin, didn't go to the high priest. He went to shepherds. And you know why he went to shepherds? They had the secret of the table land. They understood something he said. Let me get this right. Here we go. Please stay with me. First, he went to shepherds because shepherds spiritually represent the pastors of our church the men and women of God who are supposed to pastor us and care for us. And when they saw what they saw, they went out and spread it all over the town. And that's what pastors are supposed to do. Seek the face of God. And when God shows them what they're supposed to do, then he says, leave it to the people. Thou hypocrisy, O partial. Amen? But here's the key. Why is this so important? Check this out. For you shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. Why does that mean anything? Why? They were shepherds. What was their job? <laughs> to provide lambs for the sacrifice. Oh, y'all ain't listening to me. Part of their job was to provide lambs for the sacrifice. And Terrell, when you provide a lamb for the sacrifice, it cannot have spot. It cannot have blemish upon it. It cannot be injured in any way. Guess what you do, John Crandall, to get a lamb ready for sacrifice? You swaddle it. Oh, y'all ain't listening to me. You swaddle it. You swaddle it. Swaddle with small, narrow pieces of material. And they wrap the infant up very tightly with them. So the infant will not scratch itself. The infant will not move in any way. They do this to the lambs. They swaddle the lambs. Oh, y'all ain't listening to me, church. Somebody better get a hold of this. They swaddle the lamb. So when he told the shepherds, you will find the child in swaddling clothes. Laying in a manger. They understood 
He is the sacrifice. Oh, y'all ain't listening to me. He is the sacrifice. He is the sacrifice for the whole world. We know it because we swatter the lambs for sacrifice. And now God has swaddled his own son for sacrifice. The day that Jesus took his first breath, he was already prepared to lay it down. And y'all ain't listening to me. Jesus wasn't born for any other reason than to be the sacrifice. He wasn't born for any other reason than to be the second Adam, to bring healing and restoration to the church, to restore and bring the body of Christ into alignment with our Heavenly Father. He said, I will fill you with potential. I will fill you with vision. I will fill you with opportunity. I will fill you with ability. When you, oh Lord, when you make room for me. And y'all ain't listening. What did the Bible say? He would raise up from the ages. He said he would raise up the king like me. And Jesus is definitely a king like mine. Can you say if he's there tonight? So I want you to know something. It is important that we understand some of the spiritual concepts of this message. It's God. Jesus could have been born here. He purposely had it happen at a time when there was no room in the earth. So you would understand the power of that concept. There was no room made for Jesus. There still not being any room made for Jesus. We make room for everything else. We'll make room for whatever your opinion is, Daryl. We'll make room for whatever you think is right. We'll make room for whatever you want to believe, whatever you want to embrace. But when it comes down to what Jesus says, when it comes down to the word of God and the spirit of God and the anointing of God, we ignore what Christ says. We ignore the anointing. We ignore the power. But it's got to stop. We're moving into a time. God's spirit will not always sit around and, and, and be there. You got to make some decisions. You got to start getting hot or getting cold. Because if you're lukewarm, he'll spew you out of his mouth. Can you say amen? You know, the only thing I can say about the spew is this. That when that day begins and God starts spewing, it'll be like the day of night. When day was cast, no one can enter in. He said, my spirit will not always strive. There will come a moment. And do you know where he said that at? A lot of people don't know this. You know where he said, my spirit will not always strive with men? Genesis. First book. Right from the beginning. From the very start, he told you, I've made all this, I've created all this, I've made stability, but I'm telling you straight up front right now, my spirit will not always strive with man. There will come a moment of decision. There will become a moment when this house has to be clear. There will become a moment when the hoarding has to stop and you have to make room for Jesus. And you have to make so much room for him. There's no room for you. See, think about it. As long as you have all these other things in your house, the reflection of your house will be compromised. The validity of the establishment of your house will be in question. But as soon as you get it all out, and there's nothing in there but Jesus, he's the only one occupying the house, what will the reflection be? What will the validation be? It will all be Christ working through you and in you. And I can't tell you enough, my friend, that we need to come to a realization come to an understanding. And here's the thing. God bless you. But some of you are still putting trash in your yard. Still putting masks in your house. Putting your house. Let me tell you something. If what you're absorbing, what you're taking in, 
is not bringing you into a closer relationship with Jesus Christ, why are you doing it? Why are you allowing things to come into your house that do not magnify Jesus Christ? Why are you allowing things to come into your house that do not establish you? The day has come of revelation. The day has come of understanding. The day has come of knowledge. Understand something. The enemy knows what's going on. Just like you do. He knows. He knows every house that is full of trash will have no room for treasure. It has no room. As long as your hoarder's house, as long as your house is a house of filth and treasure, I mean filth and trash, you will never have room. Exodus in your life. And you will come out of it. So what do we got to start doing? We got to flip on our light. L I G H T. L I G H T. Daryl, living in God's holy truth. As we begin to live, and I'm not talking about memorizing scriptures. I'm not talking about just going to Sunday school and church on Wednesday and Sunday. But I'm talking about the word of God becoming more important than your necessary food. The word of God becoming more important than any other element in your life. The word of God becomes so valuable to you that you want more from God's word. Never get enough of it. Amen? Never get enough of it. You have to make up your mind and soon. Are you going to keep being a hoarder or something? It's time to start cleaning it out. It's time to start removing all those elements out of it. So that when you look in your house, the only image you see, the only metric you see, is Jesus Christ. Can you say amen? How many of you love the Lord? He's so worthy. He's so worthy of praise. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I just love God. He's so, he's so amazing. I just want to talk about one more little quick thing. I'm gonna let you go. <clears throat> we talked about the shepherds a little bit. Talked about no room in the inn a little bit. Now I want to talk about the three wise men that went to see Jesus. The wise men, known as magi, which means educated, wealthy, with prominence in their kingdoms. Now, we really don't know the real names of the magi. This is, uh, and we don't really know how many actually visited him. The Bible's silent on that issue. However, by tradition, the historical thought, and the tradition, the Bible mostly say three came. I'm going to stick with that. I like three. I like three because of the Trinity. Amen? And I like three because it will help us with understanding here. Their names, according to traditional history, were Gaspar, Balazar, and Melchor. That is the tradition. However, there's a lot of conjunction. Nobody really knows how many went. They are all pretty similar to where the three gifts were. Now, the interesting thing is the timing of this event. You know, a lot of people, when you see the story in the Bible, you see the deal, you see the star, and they come, boom, and they're there the next day. That is not what happened. It took quite a while to tra travel. This star stayed there for a little while. So they didn't get there right away. It took them quite a while. Actually, Jesus was a child when they got there. He was not a baby anymore. He was actually older well, when they got there because it didn't happen quite quickly. Uh, and it happened at a time when Jesus had the food because of Herod's command. Herod uh, demanded that all the firstborn children in Israel die. According to historical data, that puts Jesus at about two years old. So that puts Jesus at about approximately two years old. So, but like I said, you're going to have theologians going to argue about that, fuss about that. We don't want to fuss about that. It doesn't matter. The point is they went and he was there. Those are the points. Amen. Now go with me to St. Matthew. St. Matthew chapter 2. Point of the matter was, the wise men were there, and so was Jesus, and they were bringing him something. But you also need to realize, these three wise men signified something very important, something that God was wanting to purge out of his children. Go with me to St. Matthew chapter 2 and verse 1. Now, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born, king of the Jews? For we have seen a star in the east and are come to worship him. And when Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. 
And when he had gathered all of the chief priests and scribes and people together, he, de- he, he commanded, excuse me, demanded of them where Christ, should, uh, where Christ should be born. And they said unto him, Bethlehem of Judea, for thus as it is written by the prophet, And thou, Bethlehem, art in the hand of Judah, art not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. And Herod, when he had uh, privately called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. And then he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child. And when you have found him, bring me where again, that I may come and worship him also. Yeah, right. And when they heard the king, they departed, and lo, the star they saw in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they were coming to the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And when uh, and being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, but depart into their own country and go another way. Wise men follow the star for two years to bring him to Christ. Amen? When they finally get to Christ, there are three of them that come. They all bow down to Jesus, and they leave or deposit three gifts. Is that correct? Let's think about this for a minute. The three men. These are magi. These are wise men, intelligent men, cultured men, considered very, very wise and very, very smart in the carnal mind, in the physical mind, in the flesh. So as I was looking at this, I believe the wise men kind of represent this. They all three bowed. All of the wise men bowed. And if you want to argue about it, say there were 50 wise men. Well, they all 50 bowed. So it doesn't matter. They all bowed, all right? So here's what it says. I believe what these three wise men represent is bowing down the wisdom of our mind, bowing down the lust of our heart, and bowing down the arrogancy of our flesh. See, You think about this. These three elements keep you from making room in your house for Christ. When you operate on the wisdom of your mind, there is no room for Christ in your house. When you operate by the lust of your heart, there is no room for Christ in your heart. When you are operating by the pride and arrogancy of your flesh, there is no room for Christ to be manifested and come in alive. However, think about it. When the wisdom of your mind bows to Christ, when the lust of your heart bows to Christ, when the arrogancy of your flesh bows to Christ, there will be room in your house. Can you say amen? There will be room for Christ to be manifested there. Amen. I got to hurry. So I'm here to say hurry. Stay with me now. Praise God. Okay, here we go. Don't you just love the Lord? The Lord is so good. God is awesome, awesome, awesome. Now, we know that they brought how many gifts? Three gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. These are very expensive, very valuable gifts. Does anybody know what the three gifts were used for? The gold provided Jesus an escape to Egypt from Herod's controlling command. The frankincense and myrrh were used on his body at his death. Can you say praise God? They were special elements. But they're three elements. Oh, Lord, help me now. They are three elements. When you bow the other three things down, these three elements will appear. These three elements will come alive in your house and bring Christ into your home. There were three gifts. The gift of gold. Can you say amen? The gift of gold. He said, why do you waste your gold? For meat that does not satisfy. Why do you buy bread? That will not satisfy, but come and get of me gold that has been tried in the fire. Oh, you're not listening to me, church. Gold that has been tried in the fire. He said, I don't just want the word with your personal interpretation. I don't just want the word as you memorize it. I want the word tried in fire. Oh, you ain't listening to me, church. When you try the word of God in fire, that means the Holy Ghost. Bam illuminates it, brings understanding, releases, oh, Lord, help us, Jesus, and releases 
before it. It's going to come before, amen? And look, come on. What's next? You got to have gold. Try fire. Because what does gold do, Pastor Chris? What does gold do, Pastor Chris? What do you do with gold, Ron? No, you buy things. Gold buys things, right? Gold bought Jesus and escaped from Herod. The word bought you to escape from hell. Come on, you hear me? The word brought you to escape from hell. The word, the gold, the pure, pure gold, the tried gold, that word that has been tried in fire, that word that has been established in the revelation, established truth of God, that word. So now once I got the gift, once I got the gold, I was able to purchase something. Something was purchased for me, Jerry. Something was purchased for me, guys. You know what was purchased for me? A little bit of currency. Oh, that thing tastes good. Oh, it fragrance fills the whole room. I had a shofar one time. It had oil in it. We opened the top of it, it filled the whole room. You could smell it in the whole room, it just filled up. Frankincense. What does frankincense represent? When you receive good word, word that is tried in the fire, word that is gold and has the power of, hear me, the power of purchase. See, that's where we miss it. We got scriptures, but we don't have the word that is the power of purchase. And what I mean by the power of purchase, the power of purchase is the ability to change your situation from what it was to a different set of circumstances. Can you say yes or no? So what do we purchase with that gold? Well, the Bible tells us the word of God. Jesus, the word of God made flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld him as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace, right? He is that tried pure gold. The word comes in, but what does it purchase us? What is the frankincense? The Holy Ghost. To take the word and unlock, oh, help me. To take the word and unlock the power of its purchase. Oh, you don't understand me. The Holy Ghost begins to bring wisdom, knowledge, and illumination. It begins to unlock the power of the purchase. It begins to unlock the power of your spiritual inheritance. It begins to unlock the abilities that have been restricted to you because of your carnality. They are now operational. Can you say amen? Oh, man, they don't make you shout, man. I don't know what will. The Holy Ghost. Oh, come on. The Holy Ghost releases the power of the gold to receive your inheritance. Your inheritance. And as you begin to receive your inheritance, Ron, Something happens. That fire begins to ignite that inheritance. And as it begins to ignite that inheritance, that inheritance begins to burn in you. The flesh begins to be brought into subjection. And the anointing and spirit of God begin to rise up and come forth out of you. And something happens. Something happens. The wisdom of your mouth. The heart. The lust of your Holy Ghost, with his word and his Holy Ghost, the ability, comprehension of purchase power, and the ability to comprehend, understand, achieve, and embrace inheritance is now present in your power. But only in your power. Only, Daryl, only when the inheritance is activated. Only when you allow the word and the spirit of God, oh, somebody help me. When the word and the spirit of God release the power of the purchase, the power of the inheritance, that last element of myrrh begins to take place. Why? Because your flesh is now dead. And myrrh is a significant smell that says he has passed from death into life. And now the anointing of is released. Oh, y'all ain't hearing me. Now the anointing is released. So what were the three gifts they left him? The word, 
the spirit, and the anointing. Oh, come on. Y'all ain't listening to me. The, oh, shut up, man. I don't you shout. You ought to jump and praise God. Honey, those same three gifts that they gave to Jesus are still a part of your life right now. The word, the spirit, and the anointing. If you'll get your house cleaned up and let Jesus take up residence. Let Jesus take up residence. Maybe that's a little different Christmas than you've seen before. But I promise you, these are the things God was trying to get across to his people. You say, Brother Vano, how do you know that? Because the word of God tells us, not Timothy, the word. God is a spirit. And they that worship him must what? Must what do what? I've just delivered to you a Holy Ghost spiritual interpretation of events that occurred that you can take, apply to your own personal life, and see a change and ramification of your spiritual relationship with God immediately take place. That makes that God's words, not my words. Amen? Timothy Vanover can never speak a word that will change you. I can never speak a word on my own that will cause you to understand your inheritance. But when I bring my mind under subjection, I get the lust of my heart out, and I remove the arrogancy of my flesh, and I allow the gold that God put in me to be activated by the spirit that resides in me so that the anointing that lives deep in me may be released, and I may be totally out of the way, and somebody get blessed. That's what it's all about. Praise the Lord. Amen. All right. All right. I got a bunch more here I could do, but I better stop. You guys looking at me a little funny. Praise the Lord. If anything I said tonight was a blessing to you, you don't owe me anything but show Jesus your life. Be what he's calling you to be. Do what he's calling you to do. And get the gold, the frankincense, and the myrrh operation in your life. Understand what your inheritance is. And understand that inheritance comes. Wisdom of man, the lust of flesh, and the arrogancy that come on under subjection to the Spirit of God. Amen? Let everybody lift up our hands. We're going to begin to praise the Lord right now. <clears throat> Lord, I pray right now, God, anyone under the sound of my voice, Lord, some of those that have filled their house with so much filth, so much uh, hoarder, I command right now in the name of Jesus that you will compel them, God, to begin to clean these houses out, that you will compel them, God to remove every element that hinders the gold, the frankincense and the myrrh that are in their lives. Lord, let Jesus become to come into their lives. Let Jesus begin to come in and touch them right now, God. There's someone watching right now. You have a problem with your eyes. Everything's kind of blurry. Sometimes you see doubles. God said right now as you lift up your hands, and you begin to confirm that you're going to clean your house up. You're going to say, God, not my will anymore, but your will. He said there's a healing that's going to begin to permeate out of you from the inheritance that he placed in you. In Jesus' name we pray. I believe it. Amen. 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 Let's lift him up right now. He's worthy to be praised. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We hope if you have the opportunity you will come out with us Sunday morning. And then those of you that may be watching, come out Sunday morning. We've got a great Christmas program here. Singing, dancing, special performances. We'll have free milk and cookies when you come in. And we'll serve a free lunch when it's over. So come out. It's going to be a great time in the Lord. You don't want to miss it, all right? So I want to encourage every one of you to come on out and be a part of it. Tell your friends about it. So next Sunday, we will not have a live stream. We'll be presenting a classic program next Sunday. A really, really old one we'll be doing next Sunday, but um, the Sunday after that, Lord willing, if everything goes well, we'll be showing you our special Sunday service. Amen? Praise the Lord. God bless you. Don't you just love him today? He's so worthy of praise. Thanks for tuning in. Remember, we are a ministry of vision built on a plan, the Word of God. Amen? All right. Praise the Lord. How many of you love Jesus tonight? Man, I... <laughs>
international evangelist and administrative vice president of Revival of Christ Club International Ministry. We thank you so much for tuning in. And if you would like to support us, there's many ways you can do that. First, you can give us a call at 405-793-1777. Also, you can mail in your support at 1005 Southwest 4th Street in Moore, Oklahoma, 73160. Also, if you have the Cash App, you can donate on there. It's money sign RFC Roar. That's R-O-A-R. Guys, thanks so much. God bless. 